and I'm able to be a mom, cook for them, provide for them. Um, it just makes it all worth it. Facing it together, the edge of homelessness. Welcome to our special edition coverage, tackling a subject that can be tough to talk about. I'm Kimberly Hunt. And I'm Steve Atkinson. Here at 10 News, we are committed to facing it together. So in the next half hour, you're going to meet some of the brave San Diegans who fight on despite overwhelming odds. Well, students and families with one goal, a better existence. I spent the day with a single mother who doesn't have a permanent home, but she does have a sense of place, at least temporarily. This is not just any parking lot. It's a safe place to sleep in your car provided by Jewish Family Service. 24-year-old Selena is here with her two children. She invited us to spend a day. It's way before sunrise, but life starts early here for Selena, and we will be there as it begins. Good morning, sunshine. It seems really quiet and restful here. Are you able to sleep here? Yeah, it's pretty comfortable here. It's been months now. How are you holding up with this? It's difficult at times. It's hard. My kids kind of keep me motivated, keep me going and trying to do what I can for them. It's time to wake up a sleeping two-year-old. You don't want to wake up? No. Selena gets help from her mother and stepdad in Mexico, as well as the government, but she hasn't been able to find affordable housing and doesn't want to cross the border every day. <laughs> I've left her rooms, um, but they don't, they won't get me because they say we're kind of, it's too many people for a room. So the daily cycle begins. I get up, get everything ready, get the clothes out, and then I'll head to Spring Valley. But nothing is that simple in this situation. The baskets with all of their belongings will have to fit back into place. Yeah, every day I do this. I'll put the three baskets here, these three, and then um, take out their clothes for the day. And then I have also his car seat. And that's how I kind of fix the car. <laughs> Today, her six-year-old daughter, Aliana, is with her grandmother. <laughs> so Selena and Jerry make the trip across the parking lot to the bathroom. Back at the car, the baby's bed is replaced by a car seat. And now he seems more content or resigned. <laughs> to the drive ahead. Selena has to be out of the lot by 7 a.m. to make the trek to Spring Valley where the kids are dropped off at daycare. You're already gonna start crying? Jerry will be fed. On a typical day, Aliana would be walked to school and Selena goes to work at the Ark of San Diego, a nonprofit which cares for children and adults with disabilities. For her to come in and just put her life aside and focus on them, it's, it's amazing. There was a heartfelt welcome in the parking lot by a lead supervisor. Pink. <laughs> Selena just started working here full time two weeks ago. You gotta go. Now she has a steady paycheck and benefits, which will help. I just always try to keep her up in spirits and just try to brighten her day. And I know she's here to brighten other folks' days, so um, I just wish the best for her. Good. <laughs> the road chip instead of the road trip. <laughs> there are 62 clients in their department, and Selena enjoys being here. She says everybody is really nice. Do your head in a circle. There you go. I like interacting with them. Um, a lot of people see them different. Oh, mouth, exhale, tongue out. <sighs> Sometimes people see them as little kids just because of whatever condition they have. Um, but I kind of just see it as going and interacting with them and kind of making them be independent. Hug yourself. <laughs> Selena says she's balancing everything right now, working hard for those depending on her to make a home and working for those she serves at ARC. No matter what, they see you as who you are. There you go. 
And coming up a little later, we're with Selena as she tackles dinner and bedtime with little Jerry from the back of her SUV. All day long, you know, that's what I would think about. I'd be in class or I'd be at work, thinking, okay, where am I going to go tonight? So that was, that was the hardest part of study. In pursuit of education without a place to call home, countless college students across the county are sacrificing shelter for tuition and books. Our attendance reporter Amanda Brandeis introduces us to those San Diegans doing all they can to get ahead. My class is right here on the outside. School is a safe haven for this San Diego native. I gotta finish. That's why I keep coming, because I gotta finish. Good girl. He's easy to spot on campus. Good dog. With his service dog, Sophie, by his side. Always. Brandon asked we only use his first name. He started taking classes at City College three years ago in hopes to become a psychologist. I love City. I feel so safe here. Safe, because here, Come on. he belongs. Being homeless, you don't have a place to go. You don't really have a safe place. Six years sober, Brandon overcame a meth and heroin addiction, but he's been in and out of homelessness for years now. Education will help me get out of this homeless situation. Education will help my family, my kids included, uh, get out of poverty. He spends more hours getting to and from school than inside the actual classroom. It's a two-hour bus commute from Escondido each way. I spend a lot of time just traveling. My sleep environment could be better. My study environment could be better. Brandon showed us the shed he's currently living in. There's Sophie. He made the bed out of recycled materials. I would love to have my own pad that I can actually take a shower, you know, uh, and, and, and wash dishes in a sink. Hot water. It's been a while. But if he can finish his education, this is a small sacrifice. After surviving a suicide attempt, Brandon wants to help others struggling. I just want to do better. I want to be better. And there are similar storylines on other San Diego campuses. Let me just show you. We converted it. We took out the two back seats. Stephanie Hernandez and her husband lived in their car for a year and a half. The biggest struggle was going to sleep at night and not knowing if we were going to get woken up by the cops. The Palomar students became homeless when their landlord raised the rent. And this being your home and having no gas and you being stuck somewhere, it's heart shattering. She was ready to quit until... As soon as I found a community that was willing to support me and lend a hand, I reached for it and I just didn't give up. After confiding in school employees, Stephanie not only learned about the free food pantry, but got a job there. The school also gave them an emergency grant to cover a car expense. We really addressed the food and nutrition part first. Um, the homelessness thing is going to probably take a little longer. Palomar College has a task force looking into safe overnight parking lots for students. They're also considering solutions like on-campus housing and housing vouchers. In the meantime, we are aware that students are homeless tonight. A 2018 study found 9% of university students and 12% of community college students were homeless in the last year. That's what a degree is to us, is like a sense of comfort. Thank you. For these students, discomfort is motivation, but more help is needed to keep them up when they're at their lowest. Uh, education will change your life. Education will change my life. Amanda Brandeis, 10 News. More colleges are creating resources beyond food pantries for students in crisis. San Diego State has a team dedicated to those in need of immediate housing. UC San Diego offers basic need emergency grants and even has an app notifying students of leftover food at campus events. A pathway to possible. We'd be walking in one stroller, I had three of them. Uh, and late at night when it was cold. Meet the mom who overcame poverty, unemployment and addiction to build a home for her three small children when facing it together continues.
we make up for with the gravel pounding ambition of youth. Torque vector and corner control and center locking differential. Available on Kia's tough and ready lineup of all wheel drive SUVs. Right now, lease the 2020 Sportage LX for $179 a month. Living on the streets of Escondido with three small children, a mother determined to rally back from rock bottom. And she walked 10 News reporter Anthony Pura through her heart-wrenching journey to build a secure foundation for her family's future. Okay, can you go put your socks on, please? That's why you have to have your socks on. Thank you. This is like the best part of everything, I think. If home is where the heart is, it is easy to see what's in Enli Gutierrez's heart. I feel like my purpose is here. Um, and to really know Enli. I'm doing what moms do, you know. You need to know her kids. That's Amy. She's four. Can you say cucumber? Her brother Taylor can say cucumber, but he's five years old and it's just way more fun to do this. <laughs> Taylor, stop doing this. And don't forget about Alyssa. There she is. She's the youngest at three. Just hearing them say, you know, mom, you're the best. That's the best feeling. But Enley will tell you, life didn't always feel this way. They didn't always have this home in Vista, and her purpose wasn't always so clear. To understand what she was doing before, Enley took us back to where she lived in 2017. I didn't even know who I was. Um, I lost myself completely in these streets. The streets near the Denny's along Mission Avenue and Center City Parkway in Escondido. A single mother without a home fighting addiction. Yeah, so, so we would be um, we would be walking, you know, like to Jack or anywhere, you know, and all these streets, we, we'd be walking in one stroller. I had three of them and I, I wasn't thinking about, you know, I was just trying to get to a place to put them, you know, to sleep. We had the hotels. When I had my kids, we would sleep at, you know, Mount Vernon a, a lot, actually. It was really hard. Um, I, I, we would stay in that hotel, and uh, I'd have actually my sister, me, you know, her kids, my kids. We weren't caring about um, the conditions we had them in, having people in and out of the rooms, um, only caring about getting high and not really, you know, just a lot of chaos. A chaotic two months that eventually caught up with her. CPS decided that I wasn't a fit parent because, you know, I was putting him in dangerous situations. When I got them taken away, uh, I ended up alone. I ended up uh, walking around the streets at 3 in the morning, not having where to sleep, and uh, I actually stayed behind those dumpsters. And it was then that Enley found new motivation. Something just clicked in my head, like, either you want to change your life or you want to die out here change started with her shaking her addiction at the family recovery center. And I was like, I'm going to give it a shot. If I really want my kids back, if I really want my life back, I have to start somewhere. Getting clean took five months, but it wasn't enough to get her family back. I spoke to CPS and they're like, look, Enley, either you go out here and do the same thing, you're not going to get your kids back, um, or you decide to, you know, go to a program. The five important principles of a presentation. In September 2018, Enley came to Solutions for Change in Vista, an organization focused on helping families turn their lives around. Many come here as the next step after treatment. The goal here is to transform lives. Shyla Francis is Enley's case manager. Shyla says Enley's transformation didn't happen overnight. Solutions gave her life structure and accountability through classes, work training, and support. But the keys to success always lies with the individual. She was working towards getting her children back. Everything she did during that time was to that end. That's when they're like, okay, so Enley's being responsible. She's showing that she wants her kids back. And, and I started getting reunification. But reunification with her kids was only part of the transformation. She works as a sales rep for Cricket Wireless, a job she's had since July. Being able to be trusted, that's a big, um, big change in my life. My kids motivate me a lot. So I know that I have to get up and I'm the provider. So now that I have, we have a home and I'm able to be a mom, cook for them, provide for them, um, it just makes it all worth it. It's a place in her life she never thought she'd be two years ago, but now she made it and she has three great reasons for getting here. Just hearing them call me mom and, and feeling that love and knowing that I'm needed, it's, it's amazing.
In Vista, Anthony Pura, 10 News. It is amazing. One of the most well-known organizations helping San Diego's homeless is Father Joe's Villages. Its CEO tells us there are three challenges facing most of their clients. Uh, one is income, the lack thereof, obviously. So there, that's one of the primary reasons um, that people fall into homelessness in San Diego because, because it's extremely expensive to live here. Mental health. I mean, there's some level of mental health that it, almost 50% of those who are facing homelessness also have. As you can imagine, in the midst of being on the streets, they accumulate tickets, right, because of maybe loitering or other issues. And this puts them further in the hole because then when they try to um, go on interviews for an apartment, as an example, that's on their record. Many of these organizations tell us they face red tape trying to secure funding. Most public funding has restrictions on where it can be spent. Groups must decide the greatest needs and try to align them with the proper funds. Donations from private parties and foundations are key to funding most services. That money doesn't have the same restrictions. As the sun goes down, reality sets in. It's not good for a kid, um, any kid in this situation. We'll take you inside the nighttime routine for a life lived on four wheels when facing it together continues. Monday, surprising eliminations. First of all, I'm shocked. This is a hard one. Prove that this season of dancing, most exciting, unpredictable season ever, is anyone's trophy to win. And tonight, dancing's Halloween spectacular provides all the eye candy you need. I think I like it. Yeah. This is the season to watch. It is on! Dancing with the Stars Halloween Spectacular ABC tonight. It's that time of year again. It's Mossy Nissan's Monster Savings Event. <laughs> With howling great savings on all your favorite Nissans. Like the 2019 Nissan Kicks S. Monster savings priced at only $16,995. But you better run to one of seven Mossy Nissans or log on now from the safety of your own home. These monster savings disappear on Halloween. <laughs> Right now, the day is winding down for most San Diegans. Dinner time, parents getting their children ready for bed. It's the same for Selena and Jerry, but the routine is far different because theirs is a life lived on four wheels. Hug yourself. <laughs> the work day ends for Selena, <laughs> much like it does anyone else. She hops in the car for the drive to pick up her kids at daycare. Today, she will only have two-year-old Jerry. Her daughter is with grandparents. You have fun? <laughs> Great. <laughs> but for this family, the traditional evening routine is unusual. This family will have to stop for dinner and a place to kill time. Sometimes I'll go to, um, to Walmart. Until the gates open at the safe parking lot at Jewish Family Service, where they've lived out of their car since June. They could be any one of us. They look like my neighbors. They look like the parents who are dropping their children off at school with me, alongside me. Director Carol Yellen says most here are homeless for the first time, and it was one thing that set them back. They're struggling to make ends meet, and then the rent gets raised, or they have a medical problem. Here, they connect with resources and get some comforts of home. Selena has shower privileges tonight right beyond this door, but she only gets them once a week, which has forced her to find other places in between. <laughs> there is community here. Food is provided in the common area, and guests become friends and emotional support. <laughs> The people who come into our lot often talk about how isolating it was to live on the streets, how dangerous it felt to be out there on your own. Aquí. JFS volunteers help make this feel like a neighborhood for Selena. Good job. It's more than just people spending the night in a parking lot. It's recognizing what they have to accomplish during the day with such little sleep and the stresses that they're under. You are good. 
soccer is clearly the favorite part of his day. Thank you, Jerry. And it gives mom a moment to herself while Jerry's in good hands. How long do you think you can do this? I don't want to do it for long, um, just because of the fact that um, I will be having another little one soon. Selena is five months pregnant. I don't really want to bring her into this world, and I mean, it's not good for a kid, um, any kid in this situation. Selena knows she's under the gun. Accepting government help meant Child Protective Services will intervene. I don't want my kids to be away from me. Um, they're kind of the reason why I stay up. I keep moving forward. Um, they're my main, like, my motivation, basically. She began working full-time two weeks ago. Her mother and stepfather in Mexico are helping, too. They're not being abused. They're being well taken care of. I know that in this situation, it's kind of hard. Um, but, I mean, my daughter goes to school every day. She doesn't miss. Providing a sense of normalcy as much as she can as she works with the housing specialists here to find a solution. I'm looking. I have the faith. I have hope that, you know, things will change. Hey, sweetheart. Oh, boy. <laughs> there you go. Jerry is in for the evening now, and Selena tells me her six-year-old daughter, Aliana, still sees this as a That's camp silly. out. Yeah. <gasps> what is that? But here, story time is interrupted oh, by the sounds of the street. Oh, Reality so and rest sometimes fight each other as Selena prepares to do it all over again tomorrow. Ultimately knowing in order to keep her family together, she either has to find housing or move to Mexico and cross the border each day. With that sweet smile, we say good night and God bless. At the end of the day, it's tiring. Selena is working with case managers and housing specialists provided by Jewish Family Service. Guests are required to connect with resources and move forward on a plan to gain permanent housing. While she does have family members offering to let her and the children stay with them, she's hoping that having a job now will make a solution possible. On the front lines of the fight and committed to the cause, up next, a candid live talk with San Diego's leaders searching for an end to homelessness. We want to hear from you. Post your questions to facebook.com slash ABC 10 News. You'll find a list of helpful resources with all of tonight's stories on 10news.com. We'll be right back. Come into a California Closet Showroom and be inspired. Collaborate with one of our expert designers. Together, you'll create the perfect space to fit your style and budget. Visit a showroom or schedule your free consultation today. Ken, what is this? It's our save the day glove. Save the what? Broken furnace? We're on it. Whoa, brother, call ASI, the white glove guys. Fixed it. Nights and weekends, never an extra charge. And welcome back. We're very happy now to be joined in this conversation by some of the people who are on the front lines battling homelessness throughout San Diego County. We also want to let you know we are carrying this right now on 10news.com, our streaming platforms right now on Facebook, uh, Facebook slash ABC 10 News, as well as Apple TV and Roku. So please join us there. Join part of this conversation. The people that we have with us today. Faulkner from San Diego, yeah. San Diego's mayor is here with us. Uh, Councilman Chris Wards, his district includes District 3, which is downtown Little Italy, some of the areas heavily affected by this. Uh, you're also the chair of the regional task force on the homeless. Uh, Bob McElroy is here. We talked with him quite a bit from the Alpha Project. Captain Scott Wall is also joining us here today. He leads the Neighborhood Policing Division for the San Diego Police Department. Chris Megason is with Solutions for Change. You saw one of his clients in one of our stories here. And Corinne Makapuga is a City College professor who also works with some of the whole <coughs> homeless students that we featured that were on the show here tonight. Okay, uh, Mayor, I want to start with you first. As the end of 2018, we were the fourth largest homeless population in the nation. Those numbers are down since then but we still have a ways to go. What right. I want to know yeah. is you had a delegation from Austin here just last week to ask you about what we're doing here in San Diego. So what is it that we're doing that people want to emulate across the nation? Uh, really, and with everybody who's here tonight, it's, 
it's really a process of action and not just doing things the way that they used to be done. Uh, when you look back four, five, ten years ago, um, we've all made that commitment is how do we get people help? How do we get people off the street now? How do you have the political will to make the decisions, uh, to make that transition with a focus you know, not just for a bed for the night, but how do we get folks into that continuum mm -hmm. that gets them a place of their own? And so on all the, the, the great packets that you just saw with, with real people that are getting help, whether it's the safe parking zone, whether it's the, the bridge shelters and Alpha Project, we have set the tone in San Diego that we're doing things differently. We're going to spend the dollars. We're going to put up the bridge shelters, the storage centers, the connections that really help people get off the street. And so that was part of what, not only that we've had the opportunity to stay with some folks that were Austin for there, mm -hmm. um, but we've had over, I think, 25 to 30 different cities in the last couple of years. 60. This is, <laughs> Bob's a 60. <laughs> uh, look, this is a unified effort. Yeah. This is bipartisan. This is the community coming together, uh, working uh, you know, with my colleague here on the city council and all the city council members. We have said we are doing things differently in San Diego. We are taking action and we are not taking no for an answer. Chris, this is the number one issue with your constituents in your district. This is the number one issue citywide, region-wide. Yeah. Uh, and we're gonna, this, uh, the mayor has alluded to, we need region-wide solutions. We need every city and every council to be able to step up and really do its part because homelessness is about 40% outside of the city of San Diego. Um, that's why as chair of the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, we've really reached out and invited other mayors and council members mm -hmm. who are part-time by nature, but you know also want to make a difference to understand what some of the real solutions are uh, that they can be able to build up and scale up appropriate to their population size. Uh, uh, you know, uh, both emergency, transitional, and permanent housing opportunities to meet the population need. Bob, you meet these people every single day. There is a myth out there that most of these people, because of our San Diego sunshine, are from somewhere else. Actually, 78% are from San Diego. Is that correct? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if that was the case, why, why don't we have 400,000 uh, homeless folks over here? You know, yeah. the, the smart ones would be here and the dummies would be on 12-foot snow grates and uh, in New York, you know, that's that's simply that is a myth. What's funny is that the biggest increases right now are in Massachusetts and New York for homeless. Well, don't say that. Those all those cities give bus tickets to come to San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> you know, see the USA the homeless way, mm -hmm. and every city does that. But. Uh, you Bob, know, as I said, Bob hang on. We we're going to continue this. I just want to let everybody know we're going to continue this conversation. This is now going from TV online. This Facing It Together special will continue there. Please join us. Send us your, com uh, your comments, anything that you want to talk about. If you have a question for these leaders, we're going to have it here. We're going to continue here for the next 30 minutes. Thank you for joining us here for Facing It Together. All right, guys, we're just picking up right back here. Bob, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but to pick up where you left off of, of what's happening here with San Diego and the myth about the number of people from out of town. Well, I say, you know, we have the best climate and really the best city in, in the world. And uh, it's if that was the case, you know, we'd have 100 times more folks than we do here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. You know, most folks are here uh, from uh, locally. I've had a lot of folks that went to school with me, high school with me and stuff that have, you know, have come through our programs. But... Um, uh, we, we've had, as, as Kevin said, we've had 60 cities, 80 delegations from Washington, D.C., every West Coast city from Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Sacramento, all of them been here. They're coming here for a reason um, because San Diego is so far ahead of all those other uh, cities. We're actually doing something. Mm -hmm. We're getting things done. And, and if anybody has an opportunity to go to any of those cities, you're going to come back to San Diego and kiss the ground because we're not anywhere near in the neighborhood where they are. They're coming here for a reason. They're spending the resources to come here for a reason. All their city council members, their mayors, their police chiefs, their city managers are coming here to see how really together we are here. Uh, you know, obviously Kevin and I started years ago on this thing. Chris has been involved forever. The city council now is all engaged. And we see it's better to have people inside as opposed to outside mm -hmm. as they wait for that housing. It may or may not ever come. But we're not seeing the calls for service that we did back in the day. When they're not in the bridge shelters, the primary care position for our folks is the emergency room at 3600 mm -hmm. bucks a day as opposed to $36 a day. Yeah. So, as I said, I think we're, we're the, the model for other cities to emulate. One of the things that we're doing that other cities don't have, Captain Wall, is your division. Tell us about, it's new, tell us about what it's doing and why it's so different and why other cities need something like this. Yeah, that's right. We, you know, we have an, an exciting opportunity here with an entire division mm -hmm. that is set aside to work on these challenging and difficult issues. Uh, I, I got to credit the mayor for uh, really having the uh, foresight to think that we need to have a division 
allocated to do uh, to address this issue. Uh, we have completely changed the approach on the San Diego Police Department. Uh, we want to make sure that we are being fair and we are applying the law consistently throughout the entire city. Uh, we balance compassion uh, with accountability. And that would not happen without having an entire division uh, set aside to this. All right, success stories, Chris Megason. Solutions for change. You've actually, and your wife Tammy, have been called to Washington, D.C. to speak about what you're doing. We saw one of your success stories tonight with the mother and her three young children. What's the difference? What's working for you in Vista? Yeah, I think it starts with uh, right intent but wrong design. So that's why we call ourselves Solutions for Change. I mean, here we are again. We're, we're talking about another five-year plan or 10-year plan. And, and I, I commend the mayor and others that are really looking at this thing in an innovative way. But w th something is really broken here. I mean, you, we look at the misery that we see on our streets today up and down. And it, it, I mean, it, it, it affects our humanity. I mean, this, this affects all of us. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we're here talking about this, but we have to do something different. What we are doing right now, you hear it over and over again, you know, insanity is, is doing the same thing and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, we all get tired of hearing that, but this is not working. We, we need not just tweaks and modifications, we need radical change, and that's what Solutions for Change has been called to do. Uh, we, we are working with federal uh, reform leaders, national leaders that are trying to literally change the way that we're addressing, approaching this. And, and we, we need to do something radically different here because people are dying out there. I mean, they are, they are dying mm -hmm. more than we have ever seen before in the, in the 30 years that uh, Bob and I have been doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's done it a few more years than I have, but, but it, it, is, it is a crisis beyond, uh, it's an unimaginable crisis. A crisis that could grow if we don't reach it early, Corinne, at a, a young age, because here we are, what is it? The last numbers we have from 2019, we all count, came up. 12% mm -hmm. of the total population are youth under the age of 24. Mm -hmm. That's shocking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these are your students. A lot of them are my students. Um, Brandon, who you had seen in the feature, was also a student of mine. So what's interesting is I have students anywhere from 17 to 70 years old. And several of them are homeless right now. Some of them have come out of homelessness. And what's amazing about my students and many of the students in San Diego is that they've decided to pursue higher education knowing it would probably be the one thing that would allow, allow them to rise out of poverty. Mm -hmm. So that does mean living out of their cars. That does mean finding places to shower. Uh, that does mean giving up food sometimes to pay for books. Mm -hmm. So one of the programs that we have at City College is our Promise program that does allow for income eligible high school students straight out of high school. If they are eligible, they get a full ride at either City, Miramar, or Mesa College. Mm. That's one of the programs we have. I mean, the reality is that there was a time in our country where working a minimum wage job was enough for you to survive and still pay your way through college. Yeah. That's more difficult to do these days. Oh my gosh. It is. It's it is. difficult just to live here in San Diego. That's one of the hard parts about it. We're getting Absolutely. some Facebook comments from mm -hmm. people who are wanting to know about what to do in other parts of the county. And I do want to ask you, Mayor, and, and Chris, jump in on this as well, uh, about the community action plan and how we move forward with this, because this looks fantastic on paper. How do we make these things become reality, though? Well, and, and that's one of the things that we've been pushing very hard more. And I, and I think that plan reinforces I think to everybody's point, we're doing things differently in San Diego. We need to do more of the above. And we've really tried to set the climate of yes for trying new things to have, as I said, the, the will to actually stand up or bridge shelter. As Bob knows, we've been fought on every single one that we've put up, but all of them are working. Um, the, one of the big things, though, that we are missing is a dedicated funding source. Uh, that's why that plan not only identified it, why I'm such a strong supporter of the Homeless and Convention Center measure that's going to be on the the ballot in March, um, but we need to continue that action-oriented approach. We need to continue the political will that says we don't just let no stand in the way for all of the things that we're doing, and to demonstrate that once we once we, we're helping folks, that it's it's contagious. The momentum works, mm -hmm. and and part of why I feel so strongly about this, not only what we're doing in San Diego and sharing with other cities, but other cities around the region, we want you to help as well, mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of why the plan is really a regional plan. Um, that says we're all in this together.
Yeah, Chris? And on top of the hotel measure, we are going to be talking as a council about a potential housing bond next year, and that's what a lot of local governments across California have been able to do to leverage state and other opportunities, private resources to really build the permanent housing that you need at the end of the pipeline. So we had two national best exp uh, national experts uh, that understand best practices, look at all of our systems, and really try to understand, uh, meeting with many individuals who are homeless, what we need here specifically. Give us a number, give us a dollar value to be able to try to build out the systems that we need, and they're talking about 5,700 supportive housing units, and that's just inside the city of San Diego. Uh, but as well, we need to increase the performance of our bridge shelter, and we know that, and we're working mm -hmm. on that. We need to make sure that we're working on prevention and diversion so people stop from becoming homeless in the first place. Um, and that action plan really has been able to help us quantify exactly where these dollars and resources that we're going to have that public conversation with next year are going to be best applied. And you feel like you've got enough people, because this is going to take a two-thirds vote. It is, never easy, um, but, but I think back to the people understand the need, they see it, and then to have, uh, again, all facets uh, really working together, the business community, labor, our homeless service providers, I mean, we, you look at some of the folks that are here tonight, they're, they're, they're doing it, um, and, and we need to give them the help and the support uh, necessary, again, to keep that momentum, because we have one goal to get somebody off the street, not just for a night, but to get them off the street permanently. Mm -hmm. and look, it's the number one issue. So we're gonna have those conversations leading up to both elections and try to make sure that we can address any question that's out there, that there's no reason to say no, uh, that we've really thought this through, this is data-driven information, and the right answer is yes. Okay, I wanna ask both Bob and Captain Wall about this next issue, because you guys brought this up about the bridge shelters. One of the comments that we hear most often is the bridge shelters, the tents don't work from people. That may not be that they don't have knowledge about how they do, they have no direct interaction with it or not. I want to ask you, Bob, how does the system work? And Captain Wall, about you, when you your guys go out and offer these services, how receptive are these people? Bob, let's start with you. Well, yeah, those are people who have never provided a service to anyone. No, nobody's not homeless because of some of these self-proclaimed advocates. But but here, here's the thing, you know, the vacancy rate in San Diego is what 4.3 percent for affordable housing up. It's zero percent for low-income housing. Affordable does not translate to us. Affordable in San Diego is seventeen hundred to twenty-two hundred bucks a month. Ours is four, five, six hundred dollars a month. And, and so the inventory, and, that, and that's why all these cities are coming here. I mean, we face the same dilemma. Nobody can afford to live in those cities. And if we build as we go forward, and we're you know, obviously an advocate for building buildings, and we've done it, demonstrated that. But those units now to build new are three to five hundred thousand dollars a unit for an SRO type uh, dwelling, you know, 380 square feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, I, we, I heard some, uh, some comments on the report that said 1.9 billion dollars to build housing. That's going to barely build a thousand units. That's just a, yeah, drop so, in the bucket. So, yeah, it's a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, where do those people go if we don't have a place to transition them to? In the facilities that we, in the, that's where the bridge shelters come in. Mm -hmm. Because they're inside, they have access to health care. We just did our rounds of uh, flu shots uh, today and yesterday. They're hep A. Hep A went away when we started with the campground and into the bridge shelters. It's a place for people to start the process of recovery. We have many of our folks that are going to city college. Now they can do that because they're not living in a, in a, in a cardboard tent out in the street somewhere. We have many people working on their own, transitioning into jobs in the downtown, those who are able. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the folks that we have in our bridge shelter have are trapped in some kind of mental illness, as am I, as you can probably tell. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it takes time to build the trust, to detox from survival mode on the streets, to develop relationships with our folks, to trust them enough that maybe we can start talking to that mental health worker, start talking to some of our job developers, working with their housing navigator. It takes time to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, they're very successful. If you're a bean counter, you know, and you, you, how many people, you know, they pull these numbers out of, out of the air. 60% of the people who are in the bridge shelter should move into housing. Where's the 60% of housing? Show me where in the inventory in San Diego there's 60% of the housing inventory that's low income. It does not exist. It was down to 30. We're hitting the 30% mm -hmm. match. But the reality is there is no inventory of low income housing. What little there is, we find it and we place people there. It's going to take time. Yeah. How receptive are they, Captain Wall? Well, I guess that depends on who you ask, too. Yeah, I think it, it, it well, it, it depends on, on the nature of the interaction. Uh, certainly, uh, we've been doing outreach for over 20 years. Uh, we work with a lot of the professionals here in San Diego. Uh, Bob's folks are out with us uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, those interactions, however, we get about 1 in 10 accept the help. Mm. 
Uh, and, and we're looking at ways that we can improve that number, whether you, you back law enforcement out of that, that conversation a little bit and you have more service providers engaging out on the street, great, we support that 100%. Yeah. Um, but you know, one thing, Steve, that I, I don't think is said enough that is critical to success here is the relationships that we have between the service providers mm -hmm. and law enforcement. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how many times, Bob, I've called you and woke you up and said, hey, we've got somebody that... We don't have a shelter bed tonight, but but we've got to get this family into a hotel. And he gives me his credit card over the phone. It literally gives yeah. me his credit card over the phone so we can put somebody in a I'm hotel. I'm taking donations, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> right. But, we've but got the, your link online. Yeah. The, the point is, is we, we were able to get that person out from underneath the stars uh, into a safe place. And that wouldn't happen, one, if we didn't have good relationships and trust. Uh, but, but uh, service providers that really are here trying to help folks get to a better How place. big is your team, first of all? Uh, so my division is uh, about 80 officers and, and command staff. Uh, we have added uh, PERT clinicians to our teams, county mm -hmm. PERT clinicians. We've also added social workers to our teams mm -hmm. from the county health and human services agency uh, service workers uh, to be out in the field to help. Those are the professionals riding with us every mm -hmm. single day. That's a big improvement to our outreach efforts since yeah. the start of this division. They're critical to us. You guys are critical to us. Professor Makapura, you have been wanting to jump into this conversation the whole time. Tell me. I just was nodding my eye. So I train social workers. I'm also an MSW. Um, it's amazing to me that the students that I have particularly want to do this work because they've risen out of the ashes themselves. They know what it's like. And it just it's such a joy to hear that collaboration and having, it's one thing to have a trained clinician come out especially to deal with someone who may be experiencing a psychotic episode than it is for an officer. The training is different, but knowing that that collaboration exists is so key. That's something we talk about in class every day. I wanted to piggyback on Bob's comment too. You had made mention of the fact that here in San Diego, we don't have low income housing. Our low income housing comes in the form of Section 8 vouchers. And if anyone's ever worked in this field, how long is the wait time for that? Yeah, 25 years can be. Yeah, 25 years. Mm -hmm. It's a long exactly. time. Exactly. It's a long time. So even if somebody has a voucher, it takes about 10 or 12 years, if they're lucky, to be placed in a home. Mm -hmm. So there's a major, major gap there. We talk a lot about housing, which we all support, but there is something to be said about the lack of affordable and the severe lack of low-income housing that we have here in mm -hmm. San Diego County. Yeah. It's a huge need. It is. Uh, Chris, I want to bring you into the conversation because I want to talk about two things, and everybody feel free to jump in on this because we get so many comments about the issues are substance abuse and mental health. Mayor, which I, I want to talk with you about, I, I heard you on a podcast earlier this week yep. uh, talking about that. You deal, Chris, you have a thousand day program with Solutions for Change where you deal with most of these cases. What is your answer to getting people off of, of drugs or alcohol? Well, I mean, first off, we, we have a out of control addiction problem, camouflaged as a homelessness problem. Th this is unbelievable, right? <clears throat> so as the captain just said, and we talked to a lot of law enforcement folks, and the, the things that they see and that we see is off the charts, right? So why is that? Why all of a sudden are we having this explosion? Well, we know about Prop 47 and 57. There's some legislation that has come down from the state that has uh, essentially decriminalized uh, a lot of this, you know, the hardcore drug use. But really, I think beyond that, what we have today, Steve, is we have something going on in our communities here that I've never seen. And, I, and I've been at this addiction problem for over 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have people that have so much more emotional pain and just they are checking out and it is so easy to escape today mm -hmm. compared to 10 years ago. You have access to all kinds of drugs. You can get it just like that and video games and it's just not drugs. It's just all these different ways to escape. And for most of us, you know, when we grew up, right, we'd do bonehead stuff and we'd make mistakes. But then, you know, resiliency, persistence, we pull ourselves out and we do this thing called life. These people are checking out and they are checking out with heroin and methamphetamine and the kinds of drugs that are literally killing people on the street. And if we keep treating this as a housing issue, we are going to lose. So you're this treating is, both. Well, you, it's not it's not about we can, we're never going to build our way out of homelessness. Mm -hmm. We've got to build people. We have to lift them up, invest in them, grow them beyond their vulnerabilities and end their dependencies or 
we think we're in trouble now, it's going to get 10 times worse. We, we will never solve this mm -hmm. with the idea of just building a bunch of housing for five to seven hundred thousand dollars a year. So I'm going to jump in here and actually yeah. just try to intervene a little bit because mm -hmm. I don't think we're, there's no one face of homelessness. Some people do have some very complex and deep substance use issues that do need, I think, a much stronger type of intervention here. But at the root cause, we know we do have a housing challenge here in the city of San Diego. So we actually do need to make sure that we are working on all strategies to produce that low income housing units. Because at the end of the pipeline, when somebody is stabilized, as you saw from some of the same clients that we saw here in this, in this program here before, those that are participating in our safe parking programs, they need an affordable housing unit for themselves and their family. We are working in the city of San Diego. We have tripled this year's budget uh, for a program that's specifically works for diverting individuals who are intoxicated with the McAllister Institute to be able to work on short-term mm -hmm. stays and try to actually give them an alternative to incarceration and actually a positive pathway forward. So there are, you know, when we talked of earlier about the myths about some individuals that might be from outside of the city of San Diego, one of the common challenges that we hear is that everybody is, uh, has a mental health crisis, a severe mental health issue, mm -hmm. or everybody's on drugs. Um, it's a lot of the hidden homeless that are putting a lot of pressures on the system whose issues are solvable and who are right in front of us and we can work on that. Meanwhile, you have to have a different layer of intervention, a different layer of social services out there to work on those with more complex issues. Mayor, you talked about that in a podcast about the mental health issue last week out of LA, yeah. but there's actually been studies that show that that's also not the case either. So what are, are we seeing something isolated here in your mind? No, I mean, I think what you're seeing and we're seeing not only in San Diego, but, but in Los Angeles as well. And again, our, our bridge shelters have really given us a, a real window into what's happening on the street. You know, Bob will tell you, you know, close to about 60% of the folks that are in the Alpha Bridge Shelter tonight, be their mental health or substance abuse or both. Mm -hmm. uh, that's real. That, that's just undeniable. And so we have to provide the help, the support, the services on the mental health. If you go to, if you have an opportunity to, to be at the Alpha, uh, the bridge shelter, there's a whole separate trailer in the back just to, just to get folks into that mental health mm -hmm. Uh, system. We absolutely have to have that and remove some of the stigmas. Um, but I also feel strongly about, you know, Chris was talking about the issues of Prop 47, allowing people to do heroin and methamphetamine on the street over and over and over and just getting a citation, that's not working. Mm -hmm. We have to provide that intervention, particularly with folks that aren't in the right frame of mind to help make those decisions for themselves. And so I think when you when you look at what's happening in the British culture, is and why we, we, we stood them up the way that we did. Very low barrier, but get folks off the street now so you're not you know, on the street tonight, you're not during the rainy season, all of that, to give that help and the support, start accessing the system, um, and to get people back, uh, as I said, back into a more healthier place. But we absolutely need both. I mean, we, we have to have more housing, I mean, a, across the board, um, and, but we have to have, again, that focus on how are we addressing what's happening on the street now. Bob, do we know what percentage of shelter residents move into permanent housing? Do we have a, you have a figure? I think about 30%. 30? Uh, only because that's, you know, that's, that's all the housing that's available. I mean, in one week, we had a new building open up downtown and we housed 25 people in one week because there was an inventory there. But, you know, as we, as we, as new facilities come online, those are the first people that are plugged in. We have hundreds of people that are already matched to uh, uh, a voucher. Um, but they're waiting for that place. And mm -hmm. so in the meantime, as, as Kevin says, we all agree, you know, they're, it's an interactive facility where they're, they are accessing drug and alcohol treatment. You know, we, have all, we were doing outreach back when you guys, when you guys started back in the day 20 years ago. We were doing it before that. If you don't have a place to ha take someone, outreach is just a waste of time. We go out and we talk to the same people. Now there's so many outreach teams that, you know, an outreach, they're visited five or six times by different agencies with the same snacks and waters. But if we don't have that resource where I don't want to be here today, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, where can I go? If we don't have that spot, mm -hmm. it's a waste of time. And we know in the, in, the, in the treatment business that that window of opportunity is very, very short. I might be lucid enough, or I might, that window might be one day. And if I don't get help that day, I'm going back to my addiction. Right. You've, got, you've got to have something now. And that's the beauty of the bridge shelters because it's, it's that front door. Right. All right. We did a poll earlier today on Facebook. We asked people, are you in danger of being homeless? 55% said yes. That's a wow. high, high number. 55% said yes, I'm probably one paycheck away, which I want you two guys to answer this next question. Anyone feel free to jump in. How can we do something about rent control and rent increases in the city of San 
at San Diego County for that matter. What can we do though specifically for the city of San Diego? Well, one of the things that I'm really focused on, if you want to actually um, get more housing, you have to increase the supply. Yeah. And, and so that is the best way that we can not only have more units, but then provide that opportunity to help lower rents and not stifle construction. Uh, when we look at all the community plans that we've just updated and increasing the density, particularly along transit corridors, and making your ability to go do that by right, that's how we're going to actually increase the supply because we have to have an increase of supply or we're never going to make a dent uh, when it comes to actually providing units that San Diego families can actually uh, afford. There was plenty of people that say, Mr. Mayor, I want more housing. I just don't want it here. Yeah. Or Mr. Mayor, I want more homeless services. I just prefer Got to a lot go of NIMBYs, somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, we've really been pushing back very strongly on that because you have to provide the opportunity to actually change the dynamic. Chris? And you have to build that housing, of course, with smart growth principles and in conformance with a lot of our community plans, provide the programs and services where the homeless people are. So that's why we're looking for citywide strategies. The state just passed uh, AB 1482 that is calling for a statewide rent stabilization kind of protocol. And we're going to be looking closely with the city council to try to make sure that we are reflecting that uh, locally as well. And when you hear about 75% increases in city heights on Right. apartment buildings it's unacceptable and so when you're talking about 55 percent of your viewers feeling like they're one paycheck away you know those are the kinds of uh, differences that happen moments in people's lives that do force them into homelessness and even worse for students it is and I, you know and I wanted to add too we've have had a lot of focus on the fact that there is a substantial amount of people who are experiencing severe mental illness so we don't have enough beds here in this county to serve our severely mentally ill absolutely and true. we don't have enough detox to serve those who are trying to stay in recovery. But I think we're missing a major point is that there's also a substantial amount who are homeless or in compromised housing. If you're couch surfing from one person's apartment to another, if you're living out of your car, that's not stable housing. And these are people who are working. These are families. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to also shift that perspective of who our homeless is, who mm -hmm. our homeless are. And the stigmas that the mayor had mentioned earlier, it's easy to stigmatize people in populations that we don't understand if you've never experienced a mental illness or never experienced substance abuse. Mm. But it's also our working class who are suffering. Right. It's our students who are also experiencing this. So it's a much, much larger issue. And I think it's important to connect that. Otherwise, people are missing the point in this conversation. Yeah. Ca Captain Walt, you, your division is right there, boots on the ground with these people. What are they telling you that they need? Well, it's important that you know our police officers know uh, how to deal with these complex situations. I mean, you're listening to a lot of very, you know, dynamic issues that each mm -hmm. individual has. How do you get today's police officer prepared to deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, again, I, I go back to that's the value of having an entire division set aside to this issue. Does it, does it, wait, before you go on, does anybody else have anything like this? In no, the not nation? that I'm aware of. There's, there are teams out yeah. there. Uh, you know, I have 15 sergeants assigned to this division. There's 15 wow. teams right there uh, th that are going out seven days a week, uh, which is another big change. That mm -hmm. we're out there, as, as Bob said earlier, that window of opportunity uh, it could be just be a moment. And it mm -hmm. might be when a police officer's there. Certainly we have plenty of success stories out there of folks that have said, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go indoors tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, can you take me there? And our police officers are doing that every single day. Right. I want to talk about red tape because that's one of the things that came up in this issue in the special and with people on, on Facebook with us as well. Chris, you recently just opened up another center in Oceanside. What are you doing in the North County that is able to expedite the process to make these centers uh, happen quickly? Well, I think, you know, just as Bob and I were talking about earlier, I mean, it's, you know, I said five years, he goes, what are you talking about? It's seven years to build, you know, one of these affordable housing or permanent supportive housing right. uh, apartment complexes for, for folks that are homeless. So it, it is an enormously long time. And the red tape is just, again, it's, it's, it is uh, when people, when just the regular public hear about the cost for one unit to, you know, 500000 for a unit mm -hmm. and all the time and effort and all the, you know, the, the red tape that you have to go over, it, it just, it makes people mad, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, <laughs> these are my tax dollars, you know, hard at work, you know, and it's not working. And so you know, that's why we're hearing about other alternatives of mm -hmm. housing. But, you know, I guess for us, it really comes down to, we, we you know, we just came off an eight year of really intensive 
push up and down the 78 corridor. We, we, we built 200 units of housing for mm. these folks because we're getting them through this very deep transformational process that we work on. So it's, you know, uh, Father Joe refers to it as rehabilitation. We heard that last night on a show when he said it's not about housing, it's about rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really about, you know, empowerment and transformation, equipping people with the skills, knowledge, and resources they need. So now they're not in a deeply subsidized unit and they are healthy, the kids are healthy, they're working, and they're paying rent. So that to me is, is to me, I feel like that's a win for, mm -hmm. for the public that I serve, because we have two customers here. I think sometimes we forget this. Yes, the homeless person is our customer, but you know who else is our customer? Is the public. And the, those, that public right now, because Solutions had to give up all of our federal and state operating funds because of the mandate through the mm -hmm. state, SB 1380, that said you must allow active drug users in our programs and scrap your required uh, work training program. So we said, ain't going to do it, give it all up. But now these folks are healthy and they're working and they're paying a higher rent versus a person who, yes, needs housing, but now what are we going to do with that? Because low barrier is also low accountability. Yeah. It's low empowerment. It's low transformation. And, and it really is, Steve. And so, you know, for, for us to think that we're going to put somebody into a low barrier unit and then somehow that person with all of these really tough issues is just going to wake up one day. And sometimes, like Bob says, they will, right? But most times they won't. Evidence, the report that just came out that said 1,352 of these souls died from drug overdoses in a San Francisco housing first uh, complex over the last eight years. So we're going to start seeing more of that kind of stuff. And again, we have to do something differently here to really, uh, to not only housing, but also just how are we engaging mm -hmm. with people? How are we connecting with them? And, and how are we lifting them up and not just letting them, right. you know, uh, die behind the door. I mean, that's, that's just as bad as dying on the street. Councilman Ward, I know that I've read about you talking about getting other funding from other sources too. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me about that. Well, one of the things that we need to do, and that's why I think the plan that we adopted was so critical, is uh, to be able to qualify for certain state opportunities or to be able to match uh, what HUD rightfully should be delivering to a community like San Diego. We need to have some local resources as well. We need to put a little bit up to make sure that that's going to be amplified with some of these other either grant or other governmental opportunities. Uh, we know while we have the fourth or fifth largest homeless population that we have the 22nd per capita funding out of Washington, D.C., and that certainly needs to change. I'm hopeful that we are going to continue to lobby our federal representatives to make that change happen. But in the meantime, we have to dig together as a community for all creative solutions. You talked earlier about, you know, some of the red tape. We actually worked really hard at the city of San Diego to reduce and streamline mm -hmm. a lot of the costs and the time, putting supportive housing at the front of the service line for our development services department. And that's helping to reduce a lot of time. Time is money. And so that has been able to, I think, crank out more units, uh, you know, a little bit of a quicker timeline. Um, so, you know, it's kind of all these strategies together that's going to try to get more opportunities online and I'll you know again I, I think there's different opportunities for intervention for different kinds of individuals and right. there are some that find the model that Chris works on you know very successful for them and for their lives but we also know um, some individuals that have found very high barrier facilities not work for them and so it's important that we really try to look towards national best practices that are telling us that barriers that you know uh, say if you trip up once if you have a substance use issue and you know after three months of success that you show up one night, you know, that shouldn't kick you out of a program. You should be able to find ways to recorrect and actually get yourself back on two mm -hmm. feet. Uh, if you're coming with, you know, a dog or a spouse, and Bob knows as well, that we have to have a different kind of intervention, different kind of, you know, shelter and housing opportunities and not create these artificial barriers about who can or who cannot access a service. Can right. I ask Chris a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> um, why do you think it is then that after, what, 10 years now, a decade of housing first policies being rolled out in cities across California, why has the problem gotten so bad with low barrier? Um, that now today we're talking about, we're here, we're talking about, you know, some, a, a massive crisis. If it works so well, why isn't it working? 
Fundamentally, we know that the common denominator for homelessness in general is economic. And so as we've seen housing costs rise uh, 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 inappropriately so over the last couple of years, we've seen homelessness rise. The same happened during the Great Recession between 2008 and 2010. When everyone lost their job, they lost their income, we saw homelessness rise. We have seen, I think, through our Housing Commission and our Housing First uh, San Diego 3.0 now, 7,000 housing connection opportunities uh, over the last five years. So that's 7,000 lives lives and families uh, that have had a opportunity that we've been able to afford them that otherwise wouldn't have been there and they're stably housed today. So I mm -hmm. would say it's a su success for those 7,000 families. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because each individual is different. Um, we're about to close this out uh, because we have blown through 30 minutes just like that. This conversation, we're literally just scratching the surface. But Mayor, I want you to close this out for us because you've been a council member. Uh, you've been a native San Diegan. You're, you've been our mayor for, for the last few years as well. I want you to tell us what you'd like to see in the next five to 10 years and what your hope is for this city, well, because this has been your biggest yeah, initiative. Continued action mm -hmm. um, and doing things differently. And I can't stress that enough, Steve, um, because if we, if we kept doing things the same way that we did eight to 10 years ago, you wouldn't see the change in San Diego. And yes, the numbers are headed in the right direction, but we have a lot of work to do. I've really tried to establish that we're going to do this by working together. We're going to have the political will that says we're going to make decisions. We're going to do what we need to do. We're not just going to follow the same old formulas, whether it's from the state or the feds, mm -hmm. that wasn't doing anything different. That's why we're seeing other folks come to San Diego, because we do have the community will. Uh, we are working together on a variety of things, and we're doing things differently. Again, back with that goal that says, how do I actually get results now and not four, five, six years from now? That's unacceptable to me. And so my hope, um, as we continue to work together, is that we move the needle that we're providing the services, we're providing the help and support, and we're not accepting the old status quo. It wasn't working. Okay. Parting thoughts from anybody. Anyone? One last thing? We're way ahead of everybody else that I've seen, that okay. I've visited, yeah. All of right. the 30 yeah. cities I've been to, way ahead of the game. All right. Chris? I mean, just I mean, in all this, and I know all of us, you know, <clears throat> really think about this, but <clears throat> there are people out there that desperately need us. They're, they're looking for leadership, mm -hmm. and, and the, the level of misery, <coughs> it is unbelievable. Yeah. I've never seen it as bad. So I just, you know, I just think we should all um, really just zero in on, uh, on, on saving these souls because yeah. there's, there's people suffering out there. All right. Anything? Chris? There's no easy solution for this. We're talking about cost of living. You're talking about the fact that wages haven't adjusted to meet cost of living. You're talking about the fact that mothers have to choose between paying for daycare or food. Uh -huh. You have to talk about the, the issues with eligibility for social service programs. I mean, it's so, there are so many different layers here. It's not, the city alone can tackle this alone. True. Um, we need coordination with all of our service providers, with the county of San Diego also. And so, I'm glad that we're having this conversation, but it's not something that's going to be addressed in this 30 minutes. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Councilman Ward, anything? More to come. Just that, exactly. Um, you know, there are a lot of things in motion right now, and so uh, it's unfortunate, yeah, we don't have someone from the county here today, but we felt more of a partnership. Mm -hmm. Today I was sure. uh, standing with Supervisor Fletcher at a, uh, a vacant county facility, a county land in Hillcrest, where we talk about mental health and those who are exiting the hospitals but have nowhere to go uh, after they come out of the ER. We need to catch them. So we've got, you know, a behavioral health region center that we are possibly going to see come online in the next two to three years that will also have recuperative care uh, facilities as well so that those who are experiencing homelessness but have a minor mental health issue will have a stable place to go get well access a case manager and figure out what their life plan is to go forward um, so we're gonna you know just stay the course talk to the public next year try to invest a lot more local resource opportunities and just keep pushing until uh, we help every person out there who's experiencing homelessness gonna take us all together Guys, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. We thank appreciate you. everybody being here this evening. As we mentioned, we have only scratched the surface here tonight. We want to continue this conversation on our social platforms, uh, facebook.com slash ABC 10 News. Continue to leave us your comments. We want to hear from you. As we mentioned, this is called Facing It Together. We're all going to face it together here in San Diego. We want to hear your comments about that. Uh, we're going to continue this initiative. It's going to keep going on. You can find resources right now that will help you if you are on the edge of home and you need one of these individuals on 10news.com, you'll find those resources. Thank you for joining us tonight.